Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you're very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat. And you may notice that I'm a little bit hoarse, a little bit croaky, so to speak, and that is because I am just getting over a chest infection. I do feel fine, I just sound a little bit funny, but I am plenty well enough to keep on motoring through with our content, because after all, we are now back with another look at the history news headlines to mark the first Friday of the month. And this time, we're looking at the headlines that caught my eye in May 2022. As always, I'll be using the description box to link the history news articles that I'll be looking at today, in addition to any other relevant materials. We have some updates, some new news, and our new segment that's going to look at the upcoming and recently opened events and exhibitions. Also, if you want to refresh your memory on any of the previous History News Roundup videos, then you can check out the linked playlists. They are divided by year and linked in the description box, so we have them from 2021 and 2022. And now, without further ado, let's jump right into the History News from May 2022. Updates first. There is more heritage news coming out of Ukraine. Live science reported on the alleged theft of gold Scythian artefacts from the Melitopol Museum of Local History. The missing items are said to date back around 2,300 years, and according to Ivan Fedorov, who was Melitopol's mayor prior to the Russian taking of that city, quote, this is one of the largest and most expensive collections in Ukraine, and today we don't know where they took it. The Melitopol area is an important and well-known site, because there is a Scythian-era burial ground that is nearby. The theft of these artefacts has been confirmed by Leila Ibrahimov, who is the director of the museum. She told the New York Times of her own capture by Russian soldiers. She explained that she was held captive by them until the middle of March. She also stated that the looted items, quote, included at least 198 gold items, including ornaments in the form of flowers and gold plates. Some of the gold items were made by ancient Greeks and were sent either as gifts or through trade to the Scythians. Additionally, the Russian troops took 300-year-old silver coins as well as old weapons and medals. There is a suggestion that another museum employee named Galina Adrivna Kutcher was abducted on the 30th of April. This happened after she refused to give information about the rest of the museum's civilian collection, items that other curators had already hidden. Most concerningly, it seems that her current whereabouts are still unknown. Other heritage news coming out of Ukraine recounts the discovery of amphorae, dating to between the 3rd and 4th century CE. They were located by soldiers from the Ukrainian 126th Territorial Defence, while they were digging defences in Odessa. This work was then paused so that these ancient finds could be taken by the soldiers to the Odessa Archaeological Museum for their preservation. There have been developments in the discussion slash row about the future of the Parthenon marbles. On the 18th of May, UNESCO announced that talks about the marbles were set to be arranged between the UK and Greece. But despite this move, neither the UK government nor the British Museum appear to have publicly softened in regard to their stance about the rightful legal ownership of the sculptures. And while Greece is culture minister, Dr Lena G. Mendoni was equally resolute in asserting Greece's constitutional and moral obligation to pursue the sculpture's permanent return. She also restated an offer that they were willing to work together to find a creative solution. A series of intergovernmental loans and temporary exhibitions are reportedly on the table, which would of course help to fill the gallery space that would be left vacant by returning the Parthenon marbles. Such an offer has already been agreed to by Italy 
in exchange for the return of a piece of the Parthenon frieze on long-term loan. But in another article that was published a few days later, we learned that Dr Jonathan Williams, the Deputy Director of the British Museum, asserted during a meeting of UNESCO that, quote, much of the frieze was in fact removed from the rubble around the Parthenon. These objects were not all hacked from the building, as has been suggested. Dr Mendoni rejected this claim, countering with, quote, over the years, Greek authorities and the international scientific community have demonstrated with unshakable arguments the true events surrounding the removal of the Parthenon sculptures. Lord Elgin used illicit and inequitable means to seize and export the Parthenon sculptures, without real legal permission to do so, in a blatant act of serial theft. I'm not sure how this is going to play out, but of course, I will share any updates as and when they appear. There's potentially a new means of repatriation that's appeared on the scene. Chidi, a Nigerian creative designer, has founded the Luti project. By using special apps on phones, people can scan looted artefacts in museums. These scans can then be converted into 3D images that are NFTs. Chidi is quoted as saying, This is the first digital repatriation of stolen artwork. I had this idea that why don't we take back the physical works of art into the digital world? We were talking about provenance and ownership of the pieces. What if I was able to take them back and turn them into NFTs? I think this is a really creative solution. Even if I don't think I fully got to grips with NFTs in terms of what they are and how they work. But what do you think of it though? So those were the updates and now it's time for the new news. A donation from the creator of the BBC's Who Do You Think You Are, Alexander Graham, has made it possible for more than 200 rare manuscripts to be digitised by the National Library of Scotland. The oldest manuscripts in this collection date back to the 9th century. But as a whole, the collection includes a 15th century folded medical zodiac almanac, which probably belonged to a doctor who was based in northern England, and when it's folded up, it can be worn on a belt. There is a 12th century manuscript of the rule of the Knights Templar order, which includes advice on the superfluity of beards and moustaches. There is a tiny 15th century book of hours from Italy, which is decorated in gold illumination. And there is an early 16th century manuscript that was written and illuminated in Dunkeld. The manuscripts curator at the National Library in Edinburgh said, quote, This fascinating digitised collection is international in origin, though a large part of the volumes were written in Scotland. The survival rate of medieval Scottish manuscript volumes is generally low. For example, only 1% of religious manuscripts of Roman Catholic use, many of which were systematically destroyed during and after the Scottish Reformation, are believed to still be in existence. It is difficult to estimate how many cultural treasures were lost during these times. The collection presented here includes a number of those fortunate survivors that have endured subsequent centuries. We're delighted to make these extremely rare pieces of history publicly accessible online. I will be linking the website where these digitised manuscripts can be explored in the description box in case you want to check that out. Researchers studying the remains of people buried in a Bronze Age cemetery on the island of Westray, which is one of the northernmost islands of Orkney, have found evidence to suggest that large numbers of women from the European continent migrated to the Orkney Islands during the Bronze Age, approximately 4,500 years ago. According to the researchers, the cemetery was primarily the site for burial for just three extended families. Additionally, they found that the males in the cemetery had long ties that connected them to the island or its surrounding area, while, as mentioned, many of the females were more diverse. They had arrived on the island through migration. These women brought aspects of their own culture with them as they migrated which in turn became incorporated into their new community. Thanks go to Maria Karosha for letting me know about this next news item over on Twitter. This summer, a team of specialists in marine archaeology will search for the remains of the HMS Gatsby, 
a British revenue schooner that was burned down to the waterline by Rhode Island colonists on the 10th of June, 1772. The Providence Journal provides the following explanation of what happened to the Gatsby. It was tasked with enforcing British customs regulations in Narragansett Bay, making sure duties had been paid on goods and that contraband wasn't being shipped around Rhode Island. On the day in question, the Gatsby gave chase to a ship called Hannah, sailing from Newport to Providence, perhaps with a cargo of contraband, perhaps carrying British money. The Hannah, a small ship that didn't ride as deeply in the water as the Gatsby, raced into the shallows of Namquid Point. The Gatsby followed, but with the tide low, became stuck on a sandbar. The ship's crew would only have to wait for the next high tide to float off and sail away, but before that could happen, a party from Providence, led by merchant John Brown, captured the Gatsby and burned it. It is unclear what, if anything, may remain to be found, or indeed where it might be located, but if the remains are uncovered, it is hoped that they may contain a veritable trove of items that belong to the crew, and thus help to deepen our understanding about life on board ships like this during this period. If the wreck is located, the team will set to work on preserving and raising the find, but this will be a complicated, time-consuming and expensive process. I will let you know of any updates with regard to this search, if and or when they emerge. This vase was bought in the 1980s for a few hundred pounds and was apparently kept in a kitchen. A visitor, who happened to be an antique specialist, spotted that this was not your run-of-the-mill home decor piece. Instead, it is an extremely rare 18th century blue glazed silver and gilt vase that was created for the court of the Chinese Qianlong Emperor. When the vase was auctioned, it was expected to fetch between £100,000 and £150,000. As it was, it sold to an international buyer over the telephone, and the hammer price was £1,200,000, with the bidder paying £1,449,000 if you include the buyer's premium. As of now, the buyer and their location continue to remain undisclosed. A silver casket, made in Paris between 1493 and 1510, which is thought to have been given to Mary Queen of Scots by her first husband, Francis II of France, has been bought for the nation for £1.8 million. It went on display last month at the National Museum of Scotland, and the photographs of this casket in the press show just how detailed and elaborate it is. However, it is possible that it connects to a low point in Mary's life too, because a handwritten note that dates from the late 17th century, which was stored with the casket, recalls the belief that it was produced at a hearing ordered by Elizabeth I against Mary at Westminster in December 1568. The evidence within has become known as the casket letters. Allegedly, these were love letters and poems from Mary to her third husband, James Hepburn, Earl of Bothwell. And these documents implicated both of them in the murder of Mary's second husband, Henry Stuart, Lord Darnley. Do let me know if you are in Edinburgh and get the chance to see this casket in person at the National Museum of Scotland. Thanks go to Margot on Twitter for sending me this art news selection of news items, which includes headlines about the culture minister of Cambodia, quote, petitioning the UK to return certain important cultural treasures that wrongfully ended up in British warehouses and museums in the wake of Cambodia's civil war. Large museums like the British Museum or the V&A, they shouldn't have accepted these pieces, said the Cambodian Ministry of Culture's chief legal counsel. Both museums have now received lists of objects believed to be looted in their collections. Also included in that selection is news that a British and German tourist are facing the death penalty, as they stand accused of smuggling culturally significant Iraqi antiques out of the country. The accused have so far testified that they did not act with criminal intent and did not know they were breaking local laws. Years of campaigning and fundraising, spearheaded by teenager Evie Swire, have culminated in the unveiling of a statue of Mary Anning in Lyme Regis, 
Anning's contribution to paleontology was not recognised during her lifetime due to her sex and social class. Instead, the men who moved in scientific circles would buy her fossils and pass them off as their own finds. But over time, her contribution has come to be recognised, and I would say that this statue is another step in the right direction when it comes to giving her the credit that she has always deserved. Making these History News videos has shown me a number of things. Check your attic for lost artworks by the greats and your garden for sculptures from them too. But the other thing I am learning is that I should probably go and buy a metal detector and just start going beeping about the place. Because once again, we have news of an amateur archaeologist with a metal detector finding something spectacular. Daniel Ludin was using his metal detector to explore a section of forest in Switzerland when he was alerted to something beneath the ground. He dug down to find a clay pot that was filled with 1,290 coins. He presented his find for examination, and it has been determined that he has found a cache of coins from the 4th century CE. At that time, Switzerland was part of the Roman Empire, which was being headed by the Emperor Constantine. According to Smithsonian Magazine, it is thought that, quote, Based on the coin's composition, copper alloy and traces of silver, the treasure wouldn't have gone far at the time of its burial. Instead, it was simply a large stack of small change, equal to about two months of earnings for a soldier. Researchers have stated that there is still more that can be learned from studying this find, to deepen our understanding of its context and how it might be interpreted. So, we may have some further updates connected to this find that may come out in due course. Remember how I was talking about the value of checking your attic out a moment ago? Well, here's the proof. This painting had been purchased by a collector from St Albans, and until recently was stored in his attic, as he did not have space to display it. However, it is now being suggested that it may be the first genuine portrait of Oliver Cromwell's mother. Conservators have confirmed that the portrait was painted in the early to mid-17th century and that the materials used and the style were, in quotes, consistent with that. The portrait has not been authenticated as being of Elizabeth Stewart yet, but perhaps, with ongoing investigation of the piece, such a conclusion may be able to be made eventually. So this next headline popped up on my newsfeed right away, but it was also the headline that I got sent the most last month too. A woman who purchased this marble bust from a Goodwill thrift store in Austin, Texas in 2018 for $34.99 set out to discover its provenance. Before long, photos from the 1930s were found in a digital database which show the sculpture to have been in Bavaria, Germany at that time. Maya Yang, writing for The Guardian, explains that, quote, The bust was once kept at Pompeianum, a replica of a Pompeii-style Roman home that was commissioned by King Ludwig and built in the 1840s. Pompeianum displayed the bust until the Second World War, when groundskeepers placed the sculpture and other relics in storage as the villa came under attack. For about the next 80 years, the bust's whereabouts were unknown, until Young dug it up at a goodwill. Sotheby's went on to confirm the bust was around 2,000 years old and was from ancient Rome. It has also been suggested that it may have belonged to the Roman military leader Sextus Pompey. The bust was loaned to the San Antonio Art Museum for a year, but Germany, who still technically own the piece, as it was stolen from their storage, anticipates that it will be returned in May 2023, at which point it will then in turn be returned to the Pompeianum and displayed there. Thanks go to Abby on Twitter for sending me a link to this article about how 3D scans have revealed previously unseen giant figures, including life-size drawings of humans in enigmatic regalia and an 11-foot diamondback rattlesnake in a cave in Alabama. The cave is known as the 19th Unnamed Cave and its exact location remains secret, but it is somewhere on private land in northern Alabama. Jan Simic, an archaeologist at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, points out that, quote, it wasn't doodling. 
They had to lay them out, at least in their head, and maybe even a little bit on the wall, in order to be able to draw them the way they did. The meaning of the human figures remains unknown, but Simek believes that the artwork was spiritually significant, as the region's indigenous groups considered caves portals to the underworld during the so-called woodland period when the art was created. Descendant groups, such as the Cherokee, attest to that significance as well. Simek again, quote, It's important to stress that the archaeology we're talking about here is part of a continuum that is still with us. It's not just history. The descendants of these people are still alive, still with us. The cultures are still with us. They're vibrant and living. I look forward to seeing what else researchers will come to understand about this site and its art. Thanks go to Verity for taking to Twitter to make me aware of this auction. Chiswick Auctions titled the event Happy and Glorious, A Royal Sale. It took place on the 31st of May at 1pm GMT, so just before the kickoff of the Platinum Jubilee celebration weekend. 110 lots of royal memorabilia were up for grabs, including slices of cake from three events. First, the wedding of Prince Charles and Camilla Parker Bowles. This piece of cake was estimated to fetch between £250 and £350. The second came from the diamond wedding anniversary of Her Majesty the Queen and Prince Philip, which was estimated to fetch between £200 and £300. And the third piece of cake came from the wedding of the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge and was estimated to fetch between £400 and £600. While these may be expensive estimates for cake, they are relatively inexpensive as far as the other lots go. The lot with the highest estimated price is this portrait of Prince Philip, by Felix Topolsky, that was expected to sell for £7,000 to £12,000. Another lot, the second most expensive according to the estimates, is this early pair of knickers that once belonged to Queen Victoria which were expected to sell for £5,000 to £7,000. The Walker Art Gallery in Liverpool has borrowed a set of wrought iron ankle shackles that once restrained people below deck on slave ships. Mark Brown, writer for The Guardian, explains that the Walker is displaying the shackles, quote, near sculpted portraits of the Sandback family, made in the 19th century by John Gibson. Liverpool's leading sculptor. The family members were part of the Sandback Tin and Co dynasty that made an immense fortune trading in enslaved people and their output, including sugar, rum, molasses, timber and coffee. Members of the Sandback family included merchants, politicians, clergy and philanthropists. And they were key players in the development of Liverpool. They became dizzyingly wealthy largely through the slave trade. The family were awarded substantial claims in compensation after the abolition of slavery in 1833. A representative from the Walker said that the decision about the placement of the shackles, quote, was made to show that slavery does not only exist in history and inside the walls of the International Slavery Museum, but that its legacies are still present in our streets in our buildings, and in our culture today. Is this the answer, or an answer, for when it comes to the question of how we confront and provide full context for art pieces like this, ones that memorialise enslavers? So that was the new news, and now it's time to look at the events and exhibitions that caught my eye. There are quite a few, and they are all in England which I think is partly explainable because institutions seem to be trying to compete with each other to pull in crowds for the Platinum Jubilee year. So in short, everyone does seem to have just stepped up their game a little bit. Tate Britain is hosting a major retrospective of Walter Sickert's work, which will run until the 18th of September 2022. In addition to being recognised as one of the most important and influential artists of the 20th century, He also stands accused by some, including Patricia Cornwall, of being responsible for the crimes of Jack the Ripper. Cornwall even believes that Sickert's art 
functions as a form of confession to the crimes. So, will you be heading down to Tate Britain to see if you agree? Next up is an exhibition that is running until the 30th of October 2022. Visitors to Sutton Hoo will have a rare opportunity to view two of the most important archaeological discoveries ever to be made together. The Staffordshire Hoard is being exhibited alongside the treasures from the Great Ship Burial at Sutton Hoo. The exhibition is titled Swords of Kingdoms, the Staffordshire Hoard at Sutton Hoo. Visitors will need to book a free timed ticket to this special exhibition in addition to paying for your admission ticket in order to ensure that you will be able to access the display. The home of Henrietta Howard, Countess of Suffolk, has been restored and is now open to the public. Henrietta was part of an exciting literary circle during the Georgian period, in addition to being a mistress of George II. Marble Hill is looked after by English Heritage and it is free for everyone to visit. Superbloom is now open in the moat of the Tower of London and it will remain in place until the 18th of September. The moat will be filled with flowers during this period and it can be accessed using a slide. Superbloom is the first stage of a permanent transformation of the moat into a new, more natural landscape. However, the team in charge of the project have pointed out that the cold and dry conditions that were experienced in April has left some of the plants in the moat a little bit behind where they were expected to be. And for this reason, some people may wish to wait a little bit to book their tickets. But for those who have already booked a visit between the 1st and the 15th of June, HRP is offering the option to visit as planned between those dates. And then from the 16th of June onwards, those visitors will be able to book a return ticket for free. I do think it's worth letting you know that if you do have plans to come to the Tower and to Superbloom more than once, and or if you are keen to visit any of the other historic Royal Palaces sites, then by and large, your most cost effective option is to purchase a membership. So that might be something that you want to look into. And last, but by no means least, if the Tower is part of your plan, then you might also want to check out the gunpowder plot. This is an immersive experience that is taking place in the vaults opposite the Tower of London. It uses something called layered reality, which combines the latest digital tech, so virtual reality, projection mapping and volumetric holograms together with live theatre. So live actors, movie scale sets and special effects. Plus, there's real physical sensations. Touch, temperature, smell, sound and music, physical movement and taste, all of which is being done in an attempt to transport audiences into the world of the gunpowder plotters. Ticket prices start at £40 and are bookable for dates up to the 4th of September 2022, but the experience does appear to be running for quite some time past that. But what do you think? of any or all of the headlines that we've looked at today. Were there any headlines that caught your eye in May that I didn't discuss in this video? What about any exhibitions or events that you may have spotted? As always, I'm looking forward to reading your conversations in the comments section underneath this video, or you can find me elsewhere on social media. I will leave links to all the other places you can find me on the internet in my description box, so please do follow me over on some or all of them so that we can continue this conversation and start some others. I do hope you enjoyed this video and found it useful. And if you did, why not share it with your friends? Please also let me know you liked it by hitting the thumbs up. Please subscribe to the channel. And if you think you're subscribed, please have a little check now, just to make sure that YouTube hasn't mysteriously unsubscribed you. While you're there, checking, subscribing, maybe resubscribing, why not hit the bell icon that sits beside the subscribe button so that YouTube will tell you when I've next uploaded. And with that, I'm going to go away and rest my voice. And I have no doubt that my husband will be very grateful to know that he can expect quiet for the next few hours, maybe even days. But I do hope that you're going to have a great day, whatever you're doing. And I look forward to speaking to you all in my next video, when hopefully I will sound a little bit better. But for now, Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.